number one business show with me, Kalila Reynolds, three-time business journalist of the year. Inflation in Jamaica is at its highest in six years, and businesses are expecting it to get even worse. They're projecting nearly 8% inflation this year. But on the bright side, the government's tax revenues are ahead of budget. We'll talk about it with Chairman of the Economic Program Oversight Committee, Keith Duncan. And the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. China says no to Bitcoin, effectively banning cryptocurrency trading in the country. Credit ratings agency Moody's has downgraded the Bahamas' sovereign credit worthiness, and Pulse's latest results are out. How did they do? This and more on Taking Stock Live, the Caribbean's number one business show, with me, Kalila Reynolds, three-time business journalist of the year. And that would be me. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Taking Stock Live. So happy to have you with us again. As some people are starting to join us, let me know, of course, where you're from. Raquel Francis says, good night, money makers. Philip Burgess says, big up KRM peeps. I like those two things. The money makers, that means Raquel is subscribed to the newsletter because you know that's what I called you guys on the newsletter. And Philip, well, you know, a long time day one supporter. So you know the thing, KRM crew in the house. Uh, Raquel says, hi, Philip. Let me know, everybody, where you are tuning in from. We're in Jamaica. We're in the world. Uh, what you doing? What are you guys up to tonight? Apart from watching Taking Stock live, of course, and participating, make sure that you drop your comments in the comment section so I can shout you out. Philip says, they are from TCI. Marcus is in Spanish Town, Angel Spanish Town this evening. Hi, Marcus. O'Shane Taylor is in Kingston. I see somebody said New York. Wendy, Jamaican in New York. Orville is in Spanish Town. Kamar is in Manchester. Dwayne Yardman says locked in from NYC. Dwight representing Havendale. Chantel, hi, I'm in Montego Bay. Wow, I love this. People are, what? So big up watching all the way from Japan. Wow, we're truly worldwide this evening. We're global. KRM to the world, right? Love it, love it, love it. So thanks for joining us. Yet another live episode. If you don't know by now and it's your first time joining us, my name is Kalila Reynolds and welcome to this live episode of Taking Stock. Remember, we're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. As you saw in the teaser just now, talking about a very important topic tonight, uh, inflation, money, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, some other topics as well. And you can also head over to my website, kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter to subscribe to my newsletter. What's Hot in Business is coming up next. And you can get a text version of that in your email once you subscribe to the newsletter. So make sure that you do that. Uh, oh, also... If you haven't gotten my guide to choosing a stockbroker in Jamaica, you get that for free when you subscribe to the newsletter. So come on, let's get this money. Here's what's hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Educom Cooperative Credit Union is seeking to raise $250 million by issuing deferred shares to its members, other cooperatives, and member organizations including pension funds. The shares are priced at $1 each. Similar to a preference share, a deferred share is a share of stock on which a dividend is not paid until some fixed date. In this case, the first dividend payment will become due and payable on December 15th. Thereafter, it will be payable quarterly on the 15th day of the month once it falls on a regular business day. Deferred shareholders, however, have no ownership rights in the credit union. The offer opened last week and is scheduled to close on November 10. Shares are fixed at 6.5% per year and will be redeemable in 2026. The minimum that can be invested is 25,000 Jamaican dollars. Money Masters Limited, a licensed securities dealer, is acting as lead arranger for the offer. 
Educom says it's seeking to have the deferred shares listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange so that shareholders can cash out before maturity if they want to. However, the credit union said there was no guarantee that would be done. Educom says it intends to use the proceeds to improve its technology platform, finance other working capital needs, and expand its capital base. Meanwhile, on the equities market, Barita Investments has successfully raised the $10 billion targeted in its additional public offering APO, which closed last Wednesday, as scheduled. 125 million ordinary shares were originally offered at a price of $8 per share. A posting on the Jamaica Stock Exchange's website stated that Barita will advise on the basis of allotment of the APO in due course. It added that the decision with respect to upsizing the offer will also be communicated at that time. Upsizing the offer would net them $15 billion total. Barita says the funds will be used to grow its investment pipeline. Cygnus Real Estate Finance has raised 3.2 billion Jamaican dollars in financing to complete its one Belmont commercial development in New Kingston. The capital raise consists of a construction loan of 2.5 billion provided by National Commercial Bank NCB and 650 million dollars in preference shares arranged by Cygnus Capital Limited. The additional financing comes on the heels of the company's $2.3 billion initial public offer IPO. The company has fallen short of its goal of raising about $3.9 billion from the IPO, which closed September 10, instead raising $2.3 billion. The new financing now forms part of the $7.2 billion in total financing that SRF has secured over the past five months to fund projects across various real estate assets. The One Belmont project will deliver 79,000 square feet of commercial offices, supported by four levels of parking, rooftop entertainment for corporate events, LED lighting surrounding the building, as well as a host of other unique features. First Rock Private Equity is acquiring a 26% stake in the Bahamian manufacturing and distribution company My Ocean Limited. The agreement was signed in Nassau recently, however the price of the transaction has not been disclosed. The deal is subject to regulatory approval. It's scheduled to be completed by the fourth fiscal quarter of 2021, subject to any mutually agreed extension. My Ocean, incorporated in 2005, operates from a 10,000 square feet studio in Nassau. It provides a variety of unique, authentic Bahamian products, which are distributed through eight prime locations in the Bahamas, including Bahamar, Atlantis, and the Linden Pindling International Airport. Managing Director of First Rock Private Equity Chris Young says the purchase is in line with the company's growth strategy and will allow them to enter the real sector and diversify its private equity portfolio. It's the company's second acquisition of 2021 after Dollar Financial Services, which has operations in Jamaica and Guyana. In the meantime, Dollar Financial has inked a deal with Dermont Trading to become the preferred finance partner for the company's employees and contractors. Through Dollar, Dermont will now be able to offer loan packages to staff, customers and contractors impacted by the pandemic. The partnership forms part of Dollar's expansion and diversification strategy and is expected to boost performance, staff morale and profits for both parties. CEO of Dollar Financial Services, Kadeen Mayers, says the deal will lead to new financing products for persons within the distribution and logistics business as the company moves to find new ways to help individuals and business owners maneuver the pandemic. Group Chief Financial Officer at Derman, Ian Kelly, says the partnership will help to give team members peace of mind as they all adapt to a new way of living. China's top regulators on Friday issued a blanket ban on all crypto transactions and mining, hitting Bitcoin and other major coins, and pressuring crypto and blockchain-related stocks. Friday's statement is the most expansive yet, underscoring Beijing's commitment to halting the Chinese crypto market, which it believes could undermine government control in the financial and monetary systems. It also marked the first time the Beijing-based regulators have joined forces to explicitly ban all cryptocurrency-related activity. Ten agencies, including the central bank, financial, securities and foreign exchange regulators were involved. China's cabinet had vowed back in May to crack down on Bitcoin mining and trading as it sought to mitigate financial risks. Meanwhile, despite the initial shock, analysts say they do not expect the crackdown to dent global crypto asset prices long term as companies continue to adopt crypto products and services. What's Heart was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart.
Hey, money makers, you're not an official part of the family until you have your merch. Visit kalilareynolds.com slash store to order your t-shirt and your mask today. Let's get this money. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Yeah, there we go. So I was saying, good thing I wasn't doing anything untoward just now when the camera unexpectedly came to me. I also mentioned that this segment of Taking Stock is brought to you. We said Bulwark is also brought to us by Appleton Estate. So yeah, what's business without a little room in between? Yeah, how many business deals do we make uh, in informal settings? Yeah, uh, a little update as well to a story we just carried in What's Hot. It was on the Barita APO. We said that they would be advising whether it was uh, oversubscribed and how much they were going to uh, accept. So that email came in earlier today i think it was this afternoon i saw that email this is benefit of having a live show because we can give you updates in real time so they did they were oversubscribed by about just under 10,000 shares so the invitation has raised a total of 10.78 billion dollars so the the original allotment or the original subscription would have been 10 billion and they were aiming to go even as high as 15 billion, but they've ended up at 10.78 billion. So they've met their initial target and then some. And uh, in terms of the basis of allotment, existing shareholders and Barita clients get 100%. Basically, everybody get 100% because Cornerstone and key investors, 100%. And also non-reserved, so the general public pool also get 100%. So everybody got everything that they applied for in the Barita APO. That's the update there. I'm going to be doing a, a live Q&A with Barita next week, Wednesday, actually. So you definitely want to tune in for that. They have a documentary coming out, really innovative. You don't see many Jamaican documentaries. And this one is going to be on millennial money. So that will premiere next week, Wednesday. I'm in it. They interviewed me. I was on the other side of the microphone for a change. And then we're going to be doing a live Q&A immediately after. And you'll get some more details about that in the newsletter and later on in the week. Demar Vosden says, best business show to watch. So keep liking and share with a friend. People, I really appreciate that, Demar. Yes, and happy to have everybody as our numbers are climbing. Let's get into our main discussion for this evening because inflation, guys, inflation in Jamaica is at the highest that it's been since 2014. And businesses are expecting it to get even worse. They're projecting nearly 8% inflation for this year. I'm sure you guys have been feeling it in your pockets. I definitely feel it every time I go to the supermarket, every time I buy anything. But there is a, a bright side. So government tax revenues are ahead of budget. And if you've been monitoring the Jamaican dollar, you'll see that it's finally back below 150. Today, it's about 147, I think is what I saw today. So we have a lot of matters on the economic front to discuss this evening. And joining us now is chairman of the Economic Program Oversight Committee, Keith Duncan. Welcome, Keith. Thank you, Kalila. And um, good afternoon to all your viewers. Good evening. Good night, I should it say. It is really... Really, really good to have you. It's been a minute since I've had you on this program, hasn't it? I know, I know, a long time, long time. And um, I remember when you were conceptualizing. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. And, you know, I'm happy to see you here and being so successful. Listen, proud. God, don't. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're growing and moving from strength yeah. to strength, just like JMMB, huh? Of course, of course. <laughs> you know, um, we're possibility thinkers, you know? The sky's the limit. There's no, why should we put limits on ourselves? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. So speaking of limits, let's talk about some things that are going on with the economy. I see right. Epoch met earlier this month and you review various reports. So you review the BOJ's right. report, you review Statin's reports, uh, data from various sectors. Industry and economy. one of the main things that, that stood out to me was inflation. It's definitely something that affects everybody. <laughs> Anybody who makes any purchases in Jamaica is going to be affected by inflation. So we're looking at 6.1% 
point to point and point to point simply means from, so we're in September, so that would be September last year to September this year, basically the last 12 months. Right. And then we're also looking at core inflation of 7.8%. So tell me what's the difference between the two? Well, um, core inflation excludes um, agricultural commodity prices and fuel. So it tries to strip out um, volatile pricing from um, volatile sectors from the core from inflation numbers. So core inflation numbers exclude fuel. So it, it would um, it would exclude the impact of fuel prices moving up and down, and which has moved significantly, and agricultural commodity prices which have moved like fuel and wheat and soy and all of those various things that have impacted. So it, and they, you know and you know in Jamaica we have from drought to flood mm -hmm. and then you have prices moving up and down so it removes the volatility but what this demonstrates is that is with core inflation moving year over year from 3.4 percent to 7.8 percent and um and you know and even it, the, the year before it was lower that inflation has been building and has been you no know, um further gathered further momentum with what has been going on in the last um six months to a year since the pandemic and um and therefore all sectors are trending upwards in terms of pricing so it's not just one or two areas that are moving um across all sectors there's a trending up so therefore a trending up you know like when COVID cases going up and it go up over a period mm -hmm. of time is a hmm. trend so it's not a one-off it's a trend over the last two years or so where we see inflation moving up now a lot of this could be driven by the fact that Remember, um, uh, central banks globally had to inject a lot of liquidity, just like the Jamaica government did. So, I mean, like the Bank of Jamaica did, not the Jamaica government, the Bank of Jamaica did, in order to, uh, to get their economies stimulated by pumping liquidity into the market, right? And ensuring that financial services and, and the financial sector was liquid enough to be able to work through the early stages of the pandemic. So no, therefore, that would also have increased the, you know, the um, the legs of inflation. Yes. Yeah, so is this something that is projected to continue? Because I do note that we're already outside the band that the BOJ wants inflation right. to be. Yeah. So the is it going to get worse? Four to six percent, and if you don't break the trend, it will get worse. Right. So what can break the trend? Yes. What can break the trend How do we break is that trend? If, what will break the trend? Something has to break the trend. Like you have to put in lockdown measures when um, you have to break the trend for COVID cases. What breaks the trend? And, and the Bank of Jamaica has already started to, um, mo through monetary policy action, by containing Jamaican dollar liquidity. So maybe you see like a burrito um, coming in and they thought maybe they could have gotten to 15 billion. Well, liquidity is tightening up within the financial sector because the Bank of Jamaica would now be looking to pull back in a lot of that liquidity that was injected due to COVID, due to the pandemic mm. and the, the economy. So mm. they've already started. So that is um, so containing Jamaican dollar liquidity. The second thing is um, um, exchange rate movement. You know, so the Bank of Jamaica would have allowed exchange rate flexibility because we have a flexible exchange rate policy. So what the Bank of Jamaica says now the Bank of Jamaica will seek to ensure that movements in the exchange rate do not further threaten the inflation target. So we have breached the inflation target that the Minister of Finance set for the central bank of 4 to 6% means that the Bank of Jamaica and their monetary policy committee, which met today, must provide an explanation to the Minister of Finance of why a breach and what are you going to do about it? And they have already started to take measures to contain inflation because you know when exchange rate moves sometimes even though it come back in so you might with, with exchange rate flexibility sometimes the price gets sticky on the upside so how is it now you have to really know try and pull inflation in pull in price levels and then there's a possibility of an interest rate movement up all right, so before we come to interest rate movements, because that's something we definitely want to touch, the BOJ is scheduled to meet later this week to make that determination. Absolutely. You touched on the exchange. Is it today? No, the today 30th. Tomorrow. Tomorrow's the announcement. Is that tomorrow's the 30th? No, today is the 28th. 
Ah. So the 30th would be the announcement, which is Thursday. Right. Yeah. So we're talking about exchange rate, though, because I noticed that that has actually improved. The Jamaican dollar has appreciated over the past uh, month or so, maybe two months. We're now at 147, coming from that high of one. I think we hit 156 at one point. So mm -hmm. how does that relate to to inflation because it seems the dollar is improving on the one hand, but then inflation is getting worse. And normally we think these two things are correlated. Yeah. So, um, Kalina, you, you would note that quarter over quarter, you find that there is movement in the exchange rate. And as it closed, as a quarter closes, you find that there is mo that the dollar would some probably appreciate sometimes. A lot of this has to do with, um, with, with market action, um, of buying and selling within within the quarter. The second thing is that um, as Jamaican liquidity, when you had a lot of Jamaican liquidity in the market, it could buy US dollars. Once you have a lot, once you have, um, you know, um, you have an oversupply of the Jamaican dollars or a greater amount of Jamaican dollars, then it will buy US dollars and move the prices. As you tighten up, and, and I don't know if you guys remember from the 90s when they use high interest rate policy to control to control the exchange rate. You know what I mean? No, we don't. We won't have those kinds of swings um, in terms of interest rates. But um, it, but it interest rate, what the interest rate does is um, or liquidity constraining liquidity. What it does is actually reduce the amount of Jamaican dollars that can chase the U.S. dollar. So therefore, mm. there are two things at play. What the action between buyers and sellers in the market, that on a quarterly basis, you see some uh, movement in the exchange rate in terms of appreciation. And secondly, that Jamaican dollar liquidity is tightening up. All right, so let's look at the measures that the BOJ may possibly be taking. So inf uh, interest rates have been at a historic low for the past year, probably about two years now, 0.5%. Yeah. And they had given an indication that they were considering finally raising those interest rates at their next policy decision announcement, which, like I indicated, is coming up this week, Thursday. Mm -hmm. uh, what might be the impact of that on inflation or what would be the intended impact? So the, the impact on that is when you raise interest rates, what occurs is that um, cost of money goes up. And when the cost of money goes up, interest rates go up. And when interest rates go up, less people borrow. So it, it'd be more people would um, would 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 um, look to probably saying, okay, if interest rates are going up, should I be borrowing at this point in time? Should is is is, is this additional cost to me? Is it going to impact my returns on my business? So therefore, is it a disincentive to borrowing? So um, it will slow down borrowing, slow down credit, and then slow. And if you slow down credit, then you slow down um, consumption because it, you want you're thinking of going to buy a car, or you're going to um, to buy a house. But you say, "Boy, interest rates are up. Let me consider because that that half a point or one point will make a difference to my payments." And I was going to make an investment as a business, but that will make a difference in terms of my cost of capital. So once you push interest rates up, it reduces um, credit, reduces domestic demand, reduces the pressure on the exchange rate. Because a lot of what we purchase is imported. Mm -hmm. Jamaica is, a, is, is an import-driven economy. Because a lot of what we produce, we import. So mm -hmm. therefore, once you reduce the amount of motor cars yet that are being sold, um, because then you reduce the pressure on the exchange rate. So, so this measure is expected to have the impact of reducing inflation. So higher interest rates supposed yeah. to equal less inflation? That's correct. That's how it's That's supposed correct. to work. By reducing <laughs> demand. So if you, if you reduce demand, right, when you reduce upward pressure on prices, so if there's less money, less demand for the mm -hmm. same amount of goods and services, prices should stabilize or fall and break that trend. And if you have less Jamaican dollar liquidity in the market, because the Bank of Jamaica 
is now pulling back some of the liquidity that it injected in the market after COVID to, to, to in an accommodative monetary stance is now getting more contractionary because it has to control inflation and pulling liquidity from the market by um, not necessarily lending as much to the financial sector as it did in that period of time when you needed such an accommodative stance. I see Demar making a good point here. He says uh, Jamaica needs to produce and export more to help strengthen the dollar. That's what it comes down to, produce and export more. And then tourism, that's the next thing that we've always been looking at. Services, the, the business process outsourcing, you know what I mean? Going deeper down the value chain, you know how much we have earned, um, you know, the BPO area is now become a major earner over 2 billion US dollars a year for us in how many years in this, in relatively in the last 10 years or so. So mm -hmm. the, Jamaica has opportunities to diversify. Jamaica has opportunities to earn more, but where is the challenge? We need to invest in our people because if we're going to expand um, what I'm called global process outsourcing and have businesses outsource their offices, their back offices to us, et cetera, you know, accounting, legal, et cetera, then we need to um, we need to ensure that we have the people who are trained to deliver value added services that we have enough of them because these people work at scale they work in numbers yeah i see lots of uh, comments coming in here somebody says it won't work because lots of what's familiar lots of what we demand there are very few substitutes or inferior goods offered locally so that just means that we need to step up our quality and then yeah. somebody else is saying what about reducing importation of ground provisions we import ground provisions i don't know like well potato yeah well, there are imported there are imported potato i was just thinking yam and banana i don't well, know that's what, you know so the agriculture sector i mean we need to food security that's where we need to a lot of focus there you know, um, I don't know if everybody remember um, all the shawl ways they fought. Um, coming in with the tourists is, um, is uh, you know, is um, a significant amount of goods to feed them, right? No, on the, you know, importation and linkages to the Jamaican economy. For tourism, 40% of what the hotels and the tourist, tourism trade buys is produced locally. That means 60% is imported that the target is to move that to 60 percent and that's going from 30. so therefore you reduce the demand for foreign exchange if you can produce more locally so those linkages need to be developed there is a tourism linkages council um, that has been in place for maybe the last six seven eight years and they have managed to move the needle but more can be done and we need to be probably a lot more deliberate about it yeah in terms of um educating our people showing where them the opportunities are. Jampro is trying to do so. I think Jampro should probably do a lot more focus on domestic investment rather than the foreign investors and show domestic capital where are the opportunities to invest locally that for import substitution, um, you know, um, replacing uh, imports with local production. Mm, those are the excellent points, Keith. I want to look at some other areas that yeah. you would have covered in the Epoch review. Uh, one of them has to do with tax revenues. Tax revenues are actually ahead of budget. How is it that the government is collecting more taxes in a pandemic? Well, um, Kalila, so look at this now. Kalila, when you look at what is going on with the Jamaican economy, Quarter over quarter since like the second quarter of last year. Remember after lockdown here, remember we, the, um, the, the borders were open around July of last year. The borders were closed in around March, late March of last year, 2020. And, and the borders were open in about July. Since then, tourism has been on a recovery path. And I believe we're at almost 60 to 80% of 2019 numbers. Way behind, um, um, so way behind two things. So sixty to eighty percent of total arrivals. That's where we are at this point in time. So significant recovery from zero, right, to um, where we are right now. We're we're at sixty to eighty percent of two thousand nineteen arrivals, not two thousand and twenty, which was a dead year, right. So there is recovery, and therefore, let's like, give an example. 
So travel tax would have been um, $2.7 billion ahead of budget just from um, arrivals, 2.7. So they budgeted to 1.8. So we're doing way better in tourism. So we got in $4.5 billion due to revenues. So revenues also increased in the area of, in the area of um, consumption. So where where your produce where where um, your economic economic activity is greater than you budgeted for, then your tax revenues will be ahead of budget. So tax revenues from income and profits because companies um, that are um, larger companies are doing better. Medium and large companies are doing better. Manufacturing, um, and manufacturing, tourism, financial services, uh, um, agriculture um uh business process outsourcing there they have totally recovered so a lot of these key sectors have recovered where we have um it, the 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 uh this muted growth or no growth or negative growth it currently in the areas of construction has been a big growth one also mm -hmm. is in small and medium enterprises small and enterprise my in retail that kind of creative industries entertainment that's where people have taken on a hit and in the informal sector, right? So we'd say the formal, more formal businesses, tourism with its resilient corridor has worked and has, has have they been able to build a model that to be able to coexist with COVID, you know, people complain and say, how can tourism open up? But financial services has opened up too. Business process outsourcing has opened up too. Manufacturing has opened up too. All sectors have opened. Agriculture is open. Construction is open. Tourism Almost is open. Almost all. All of these Entertainment kind of gone back now. Protocols. So therefore, you're having recovery in those areas. Quarter over quarter, we have seen recovery. And as, as we recover economic activity, therefore, tax revenues increase. So where but tell me something. Though, tell me something, though, Keith. So, so tax revenues have increased, but why isn't the government spending the money that it has to the well, level that it planned to spend? Because what we noticed uh, in in your report, in EPOC report, yes. I think I heard it somewhere else as well. That expenditure, meaning spending, is so, less than budgeted. So why aren't so they spending the money? Because don't we need it right now? Total expenditure for the period was 212.7 billion against a target of right um so 200 actual for 20 no no the total expenditure for 21 22 year to date up to july was 229.8 billion that is um against a target of 237.2 7.3 billion behind 2 billion behind on capital expenditure That's because of, of money. projects delays in projects Five billion, you have to understand this one, five billion behind because they are uh, the, the 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 provision that they had made for wage and salaries for public servants, they hadn't completed negotiations. So on um, so they so they they had it okay. as, as not being spent. No okay. that if you see the supplemental today, where the Minister of Finance has issued a supplemental budget because we're 17 billion dollars ahead in tax revenues right okay so therefore he has issued supplemental to spend that money right in the areas of health covid response and um social safety net you know what i mean and in also to in the increase the public servants for the new for the new um wage package going forward but kalila when you compare um, um total expenditure um two hundred and twenty nine point eight billion dollars in one in um in 2019-20 in a normal year it was one hundred and ninety four point eight billion dollars so the government is spending more even if you take account for inflation than it was spending two years ago in a normal year right and last year it would have spent for 2020 21 212 we have spent 212 so it's not that the government not spending the money what we're doing is earning more Plus, we had the benefit of the BOJ dividend of $32.6 billion in quarter one, which when you add that to the tax revenues, to the um, the above budget tax revenues, it gave us money to spend. But we also were able to then earn more. And therefore, we can do a supplemental budget now. And therefore, we can spend more in the areas that need it 
paying off some arrears for the public health people, an incentive to public health people, which I was happy to see, of $1.4 billion going forward. So, you know, so if you run the economy and the center is holding because our reserves are at $4 billion, our foreign exchange reserves are at $4 billion, your fiscal is fairly strong. It's not back where you were at 2019, but your fiscal is strong, your monetary is strong, you have an inflation concern that you have to deal with. And, you know, so you're going to have to take some actions to control that. But I would say the center is holding quite nicely. Okay. So those are all really great points, Keith. I want to thank you so much for joining us and for, uh, as an expression of appreciation, I have a little gift package here for you from Appleton. All right. You can see there, premier aged rum, eight year reserve. So you get the all good right. stuff. We're going to send this for you tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kalilo. And you have a wonderful evening and nice seeing you again. And always nice to join you and take great care of yourself and your team and keep continuing to prosper. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Up next, we have your market recap. Let's see who had the highs and lows, who are the best performing, who are the worst performing. Let me know in the comments who you think had it. And then after that, we'll have the analysts who are standing by. I see a lot of people talking about crypto. That's one of our topics in the analysts up next. Segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Time now for your market recap. Brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange declined with the combined index losing over 3,000 points or nearly 1%. 109 stocks traded across both the main and junior markets of the JSC for the week ending Friday, September 24, 2021. 32 advanced, 66 declined, and 11 stayed the same. 91 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling $742 million. Fesco traded the most, taking up nearly 12% of market volume. People bought and sold nearly 11 million shares in the company. The stock was also this week's second biggest gainer, up 45 cents. Fesco stock opens this new week at $2.89. Trans-Jamaican Highway traded the second highest volume. People bought and sold nearly 10 million shares in the company. The stock gained 4 cents to open this new week at $1.25. And Wigton Wind Farm Ordinary Shares rounded out the most traded taking up 10% of market volume. The stock lost $0.02 cents to open this week at $0.49. Cents. Now let's see who had the biggest gains. AMG Packaging and Paper Company stock price rose 19% to close last week at $1.98. And rounding out our biggest gains, Jetcon Corporation is up 15% to open this week at $1.07. On the losing side now, Epley 7.5% preference shares due 2024 was the biggest loser for the week, down a whopping 35%. The stock closed last week at $8. Honeybun was second on the list. Its stock price fell 16% last week. The stock opens this new week at $7.21. Rounding off the biggest losers, Salada Foods lost nearly 15% to close last week at $5.94. Market Recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, the Analysts, is brought to you by Proven Wealth and Ideal Portfolio Services. Muted <laughs> live show. So like I was saying just now, I'd like to encourage you to take the poll question in or take our poll in the community section of my YouTube channel. This week's question is the Jamaican dollar has fallen by below 150 to 1 US. So it's now around 147 to 1 US. And that's for the first time since around June. 
How do you feel about this? Is a sign that things are improving or is just you can't really butter because it's still way too high? Take the poll in the community section of my channel. The link is in the description below. If you're on a mobile device, you might also see it come up on your feed. Just, uh, just take the poll so people know uh, what we are looking like, what your opinion is. And the final results will be published in our Sunday newsletter. All right, time now for the analysts. And we have some good topics. Lots of people in the chat talking about crypto. So that's one of our topics for today. I'm joined by Wealth Advisor at Ideal Portfolio Services, Dwayne Taylor. We have Assistant Manager of Private Equity at Proven Management, Julian Morrison. And welcome back to Research and Strategy Analyst at Sagicor Investments, Jody Ann Aris. Hello, everybody. You guys are looking good. Everybody's muted. You can take your mics, mics off mute now. Um, so let's start with this topic on crypto because a lot of discussion here in the chat about it. And we saw it in the What's Hot segment earlier as well. China has declared all cryptocurrency transactions illegal. What on earth is going on with that, Dwayne? Why did they do that? And what impact is it likely to have? All right, Kalilo. So it all started last week, Friday, um, when the People's Bank of China actually released a statement saying that all cryptocurrency transactions would be deemed illegal. But it's important for us to look at the history between China and cryptocurrency. So it actually backdates to 2019, where they, they went on a, a full force mission to pretty much make cryptocurrency illegal. So it started off by, you know, limiting the, the amount of transactions that would, took, would, would take place. And it went as far as uh, outright illeg um, illegalizing Bitcoin mining, um, Tether mining, which I think is another uh, cryptocurrency. And it's just gotten worse as time has gone by. So right now, the current situation in China is that any form of transaction any form of mining if you even maintain an account with an overseas entity that offers cryptocurrency that is also deemed illegal as well no their rationale behind it is that all right for one they're they're concerned that you know cryptocurrency doesn't have a intrinsic value it's not pegged to a particular economy or um, a commodity you know, it's really based off of demand and supply. And as such, they, they believe that the exposure that it, it, it can cause for, you know, the people of the, the, of, of the Republic of China can be detrimental. You know, persons can probably lose their, lose their life savings if they dump that into cryptocurrency. The irony of it all is that China, which is, uh, which is one of the front runners for fintech, they actually have their own digital currency coming out. Um, no, that's actually out already. It's called mm -hmm. the Digital Young. Now, obviously, persons are looking at that and saying, well, it's kind of, it's, it's almost as if, you know, you're, you're pushing a particular agenda. And it would come mm -hmm. off that way because if it is that um, you're pushing your Digital Young, which is, you know, put out by the central bank in China, which but, and yeah. we should mention that is different that this is different from cryptocurrency so that right. would be their central bank digital currency similar to what jamaica is piloting now that's not the same as uh, as cryptocurrency as bitcoin but you're right. right some people have said that this may be an attempt to push their digital currency uh, as opposed to bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is it only bitcoin by the way or other cryptocurrencies as no, well being banned? all forms of cryptocurrency so whatever is all of them all of them it is it's illegal now for persons to maintain do any transactions if you're a business that uh, that formally accepted you know cryptocurrency as payment you know you're no longer allowed to to, to receive that payment or, or in cryptocurrency so it's a big issue and you know as for, for the entity for the country uh, and the scale of, 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 of China and the business that they do worldwide, it's obviously a major concern for individuals that were looking to make that their primary form of, you know, transactions or, you know, payment. Uh, but the thing about it is, despite this move by China, there are still multiple countries around the world that are still accepting cryptocurrency. No, I mean, from a personal point of view, I do have my apprehensions because, as I said earlier, there's no intrinsic value 
you know, a cryptocurrency doesn't necessarily have a, a cash flow or something like that. It's, it's really a demand supply based system. So it, it, it does cause some concern. And, and we saw it when the price of Bitcoin actually fell by 2000 US on Friday. It was, I think it, they had stated it um, in the article as well, um, that it fell by 2000. So you see that it's very volatile as well. And if you're pumping, it is. and if you're pumping a lot of money into that, it is a cause for concern for you know investors like um, like us to venture into something that that is as volatile as it. But it also presents an opportunity. You know, it's a new form of payment, and because it has this value attached to it, persons are keen on doing it. Well-established banks in uh, in the U.S. are accepting it and offering it as an investment product as well for the clients. So. It, I see like PayPal is now accepting payment in cryptocurrency as well. Is right. right. I really think it is here to stay. Mm -hmm. But like I said in a previous video, if you're going to invest in crypto, your heart half a strong. Because you cannot be monitoring the markets every day if you're going to deal with the, the volatility with the up and down. Uh, somebody has a question. Uh, this is not the question. Where is it? Uh, no. All right, Daniel Ferguson has a question. Do you see a bright future for exchange traded funds in the Jamaican market? You want you want me to say that one, Khalil? <laughs> Julian, I see nodding his head like he wants to jump in. So let me give it to Julian. So exchange traded funds are typically vehicles. All right, first of all. An exchange traded fund is a fund that is built by an investment manager and it's normally listed on an exchange. So individuals can invest in these funds the way they can invest in individual stocks. Now, there are funds that exist in the Jamaican market built by investment managers, but they're not exchange traded, right? So you don't look on the Jamaica Stock Exchange and look for the symbol for uh, proven's unit trust or Barita's unit trust for argument's sake, right? Mm -hmm. But that would be the case for exchange traded funds. Now, typically for exchange traded funds to thrive, you would have to have a certain level of liquidity on the market, meaning that there would have to be a certain level of um, buying and selling activity for ETFs to actually be viable. But what we have is a certain level of illiquidity in the Jamaican market. So it means that our market is not as efficient as a more advanced market, um, such as the United States, S&P 500, um, for example, and NASDAQ, Dow Jones 500, etc. cetera. Those, um, those indices or indexes, um, they have far more liquid dynamics. The level of trading and um, buying and selling is far more fluid compared to our market. So it would be very difficult to, to, to pull that off. But perhaps down the road, how far down the road, we're not sure. We're very early in terms of our development in our capital market compared to more advanced uh, markets. So we can't give a timeline, but we're, we're, we'll have to clear a lot of milestones before we get there. Dwayne, Markland has a question for you. He is asking. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Are you seeing sorry. it? Are you seeing it? Where is, no. why am I not seeing yeah. the question? Anyway, it says crypto no, he, does not have value. Does value. the internet have value? Have value. <laughs> no, so he was, he was. Intrinsic, intrinsic. Yeah, so he was, um, he's being provocative. So basically <laughs> with cryptocurrencies, they are, right, so they're not all created equally. True. For, for, for cryptocurrencies, many of them are tied to what is called blockchain technology and that technology has what is called protocols associated with them. What is a protocol? When you look on a website's URL, you will see the letters HTTPS um, with the colon and then the slash and then the website. It means hypertext transfer, transfer protocol. And that protocol is a language that allows the website to actually load onto the web. That's an example of a protocol. Now, what cryptocurrencies do is that they allow blockchain technology to be used in ways that allow buyers and sellers, people in different aspects of the economy, to unlock transactions, unlock certain 
levels of optionality with their money mm -hmm. through financial services in a way that is not centralized. So what do I mean? If Duane wants to, for example, create a, a real estate portfolio using a blockchain um, application, right? Using a, using a protocol, he can do it using Ethereum, right? So that wouldn't have anything to do with the Jamaica Stock Exchange or any kind of regulator. He can just do it on his own and offer it to his own um, set of investors and do that outside of the traditional financial system. So that is the whole um, pitch behind cryptocurrencies. It is saying you can have another financial ecosystem which is decentralized, i.e. outside of the traditional financial system, which is the whole allure behind NFTs as well. Mm -hmm. Because what it is saying is that it's giving you another financial system outside of the one that is here and traditional. So the whole idea behind cryptocurrencies is that they are a bet on the economy that is to come. You're betting on the future. It's kind of like venture capital. So in the beginning, it kind of seemed, um, you know, like a pipe dream. Like, how can you do this? How can you do that? But mm -hmm. these things are actually being developed in real time. There are people who are generating <clears throat> billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of energy, literal energy and computing power to actually develop this technology. Because just 20 years ago, this show would be impossible. You know, streaming didn't exist. There would be no YouTube, etc. Ten et years ago. Did we have streaming, live streaming ten years ago? I don't even think so. No. Precisely. You look know, at, the, you know, look the, at our I told my, my daughter is 18, right? My oldest yeah. is 18. And I told yeah. her the YouTube didn't exist when she was born, I think, 2003. And she's like, I remember years ago, I told her that and she's like, there was no YouTube, YouTube. when you were a kid. <laughs> oh my God, you are so old. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. But but Jodian, I want to bring you in on the crypto discussion before we move on, because it's a very hot topic. People are always interested in it. What are your thoughts on crypto and Jamaica? Because here we don't really see at least not yet, uh, a full embrace by the authorities and even by firms like the, all three of you. I hear Proven is moving towards it. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, as you said, there's a great bit of volatility with crypto. So I think our market is a little bit more not used to that great, that, that level of volatility in investments. And so we're kind of used to probably a stock exchange that was always going up. So, you know, when you're in a period of crisis and you're seeing, you know, prices going down is not something that a lot of investors are used to. And so, you know, the crypto is going to take a little bit of, it's, it's, it's coming along. So there's interest there, particularly by probably younger persons. And so it's going to take a little bit of time for that interest to continue to build. I know that companies are generally looking into it to see how it is that they can do some inclusion. I know that from a regulatory standpoint, there is discussion occurring around cryptocurrency, but it's relative to the I Jamaica market. I think from a regulatory standpoint, they just want to figure out how to tax it. <laughs> <laughs> Quite likely. But it's going to take some time, but we're getting there. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's look at a couple other things that are going on. Locally, we have Pulse Investments. Their year-end results are out, and that's for the year ended June 30, 2021. Julian, what are the highlights from Pulse? So Pulse, they had a knockout year. Despite Another the, knockout year because they were the top performing uh, company last year, right? Right. In terms of the, 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 the stock. So right now we're dealing with the financials. So the earnings are right. up over 74% to $1.46 billion. And the drivers are from different sources. Quite a bit of it comes from fair value gains from the property portfolio. But quite a bit of it came from core revenues. So revenues are up 19%. To 807 million so you'll ask the question how is earnings um greater than revenues again it's a lot of it has to do with fair value gains so more than half of the revenues came from advertisements right um they they, they actually have licensing agreements where they actually earn money from relationships um via advertising so that's up um roughly 40 percent year over year and then the next in line in terms of revenue growth was rental income, which is up 9.75%. Um, what's important is that the quick opening of the New York market 
in terms of uh, fashion and entertainment that allowed the company to recover quickly within the context of the pandemic because they were able to send their talent to shows that are in New York so they could actually earn because Pulse is an agency. So kind of like a sports agency would have talent and they would allow their talent to perform and they would actually get a, um, a fee or a commission for that. It's the same thing for their talent in terms of modeling. So their real asset base is their talent um, when it comes to modeling and, and the agency side of the business. So apparently there's a great demand, greater demand for black talent in that space because of Black Lives Matters and also other cultural factors. So that was a big beneficiary. Um, Pulse was a big beneficiary of that. So in terms of the rental business, the company has a mix of residential and commercial properties and they pivoted a little more to office space and they were able to earn more because of that, because more people tapped into remote work. So they benefited from that. Um, and also they were able to sell their content to more TV stations. So content like Caribbean Fashion Week, they actually sell it to TV stations and they earn quite a bit from that. So those are the things that bolster the revenues and cause it to grow, but want to think about those gains. So operating income, excluding the gains was up 50% and was also good. Operating expenses were down 3%. Now, in terms of the gains, the gains were up roughly 92% to 1.12 billion. So that's why we saw earnings jump the way they did. And that has a lot to do with their property portfolio. So recently we know that uh, Pulse got Villa Ranai. They acquired Villa Ranai from mm -hmm. Kingsley Cooper. So they would actually see a big jump in the value of their portfolio because they acquired a new asset that they didn't have in the prior period. So that would cause that big jump um, from a value perspective, a fair value perspective. The other side of it is that the company would also see a big jump because they're doing developments, meaning that if you have a piece of land, hypothetically speaking, and you build a structure on top of it, that action, building on top of that piece of land would cause that portion of the portfolio to jump substantially because a structure on a piece of land is worth far more than just a piece of land with the bush on it. So those are the things that would cause the fair value to jump the way it did. Um, that th This company, I mean, I think they have a good future overall. Um, the stock itself is at about 37 times in terms of the PE. Um, it's down 12.9% from the from the 52 week high. So when you look at it, it might not be a great entry point at $4.78 from a pricing perspective, but in terms of financial performance, they could do a little bit better um, down the line because as things normalize on the vaccine front, we could see entertainment actually strengthen and their portfolio could actually see more rental income because more people would be traveling, going outside, doing more um, reservations because they earn from Airbnb as well. And they have bookings at Villa and I that would actually increase when people do weddings, all of these things combined would actually push the company further. Um, what's right. important though with, with Pulse is that the company earns substantially from foreign markets. What do I mean? This company has models that has done work for Gucci, Prada, Dolce & Gabbana, and the global beauty industry is at 483 billion US dollars and is expected to grow more than 10% each year for the next five years. So what they're earning that U.S. dollar, that highly coveted U.S. dollar, and even right. with their uh, with their TV content as well, they sell a lot outside of Jamaica to other Caribbean countries. So they're earning foreign exchange as well. I've learned a whole lot about Pulse in the past few months because we've been doing uh, yep. a, a multi-part <laughs> feature on them. So you guys, yeah. you can check that out. We have the 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 link in the description if you haven't seen it yet. You can check out our series on Pulse. Another one will be coming out probably next week. We have about three more left to go but before we go i do want to talk about what's going on in the bahamas jody Ann. they've been downgraded by moody's and right after the election to are the two things related at all no no so I, so the so the, the decision actually came out prior to the results i mean i think they would have so how it is that the rating agency work is that they generally make a decision and then have an announcement so the decision was made prior to the election so there are very two independent actions so it wasn't um based on the election that's influenced the downgrade 
Um, what it is that we're seeing in Bahamas is not really so much of a surprise. Um, I think the downgrade brings it in line with ratings that would have come up by S&P. And so it is in line, you know, based on if it is a country or a sovereign that you have been watching, um, you know, the kind of increase in debt levels. And as we have with COVID for most of our Caribbean counterparts, you know, we have been having some strong impacts with the relation of the negative impact of COVID. And so they cited the two reasons would have been one, um, that in 2019, the economy was impacted because of the Hurricane Dorian. And so naturally, when you have um, a hurricane, um, it's normally devastating to an economy. And you're probably and that was a recover. huge one. Dorian right, was a right. category five, right? That right. Was, that Dorian mashed up Bahamas bad. <laughs> Basically, because it sat over the country for a little bit. And so it was devastating. And so normally, you'd be looking to recover in the following year. And the following year would have been COVID-19. And so it is really the two, the two, the two big impacts on the economy. And so even though they had debt levels that, you know, are, you know, were probably prior to Dorian and COVID, you know, somewhat sustainable, when it is that your economy is weakening and you have high debt levels, then it becomes extra concern to creditors. You know, if it is that I'm lending to you and you're not being able to earn to pay me back, then it becomes somewhat of a concern. And so that is what we're seeing happening in the case of Bahamas. Um, you know, one of the things though with the country is that, you know, it's really exposed to tourism and about 60% of, you know, tourism accounts about 60% of GDP within Bahamas. And as such, you know, quite a bit of recovery for them lingers on how it is that tourism can come back into play. And so there were some positive numbers coming out um, you know, when you looked at the booking levels relative to 2019, but then you had the Delta variant. And so that was another mm -hmm. negative that impacted. And so things, you know, weren't looking up as great anymore. Um, one of the good things to note, though, is that when it is that you want to look at countries or, you know, when you're looking at debt particularly, is that you want to look at what they call a maturity profile. So how it is that the company would have to be repaying this debt? So, you know, what are the periods in which maturity will be taking place? And you find that for a country like Bahamas, there's quite a bit of spread in the maturity. So it's not a case where, you know, all of the bonds are all of the the issues that they have are maturing in one, two, year one, two, and three. There's quite a bit of spread. So it allows for a little bit of recovery, um, you know, in terms of how it is when you look at a maturity and the, the funding needs that they'll have. They have been able to get some amount of backing, um, you know, in terms of support from, you know, multinationals. I think the World Bank would have lent them some funds. So they are in, you know, they're not as bad. So, I mean, the headline to me is a little bit very alarming it's not as bad as the headline is um mm. but you know it's, it's still some cause for concern i think one of the good things is that they have been a fiscally responsible country and they have been maintaining you know fx reserves or the foreign exchange reserves have been improved on so i think they're almost in some cases doubled from the levels they were in 2018 and they have also been looking at the debt to gdp so if you compare it to a country like jamaica that has a debt to gdp of about 105 percent i mean they're at 89 percent it's still high but i mean when you look at comparable countries it's not that bahamas is is really as frightening as i would say the headline is but it is still you know cause for concern just on the basis of the impact and how vulnerable they are you know we're still in a hurricane season period and you know yeah, there's still people quite a bit that. that needs for the recovery so it's it's in a vulnerable state you know with death growth, you know with high debt levels and you know the economy being doubly impacted you know year after year and still not seeing recovery in 2021 so it's almost three years of hard hitting times for the bahaman economy People need to remember that we are still in the hurricane season, June to November, guys. So September, we're kind of kind of winding down. It's normally August, September are the most active months. So uh, let's hope it continues this way yeah, through the yes. rest of October, because October sometimes you get some some last lick there. <laughs> and and <laughs> it's kind of unusual for November, but let's see what happens. Glad to hear that it's not as bad as it sounds based on the headline, Jody. Because that, that hurricane thing was sounding like Jamaica a few years ago. Every time a, a hurricane or a tropical storm hit, that's why we can't, you know, pay down the debt. <laughs> it yeah. comes all the time. But thank you guys so much for joining me. Always a pleasure having you. Until next time. All right, Kalila. Thank Jody you. Jody Ann, Dwayne, and, uh, and Julian. Great to have you guys on. Stay with me, everybody. I'll give you a preview of what else is up next this week on the channel.
This segment of Taking Stock, the Analysts was brought to you by Proven Wealth and Ideal Portfolio Services. So, yeah, that's our show for this week. I want to thank you, everybody, for watching from all over the world. It's much appreciated. I love seeing the diversity of locations. When you guys tell me you're watching from Japan and New York and you know all over the place, all over Jamaica, I saw Mandeville, St. Elizabeth, Spanish Town, Negril, everybody's represented. I love it. And I want to remind you, of course, if you haven't done it yet, please hit that like button. It helps with the algorithm. So if you want other people to see this video, just hit that like button there on YouTube. So YouTube shows it to more people. I want you to subscribe to this channel if you haven't done it yet and also share with a friend. And don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter at kalilaranals.com slash newsletter. Really trying to grow and build this newsletter. It's going to be a very important part of the entire KRM experience and package going forward. So make sure you subscribe to the newsletter. Turn on the post notifications as well so that you can be the first to see everything when it comes out. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. So if you haven't seen Money Monday's JA this week yet, our topic was the Barbados Stock Exchange, because yes, there are exchanges outside of Jamaica in the Caribbean. We looked at Guyana recently, so this week we're looking at Barbados. And then tomorrow on Money Moves JA, it's a really important question for businesses that are trying to scale or have scaled how do you maintain the quality as you scale your business? A lot of times people, your, your business grows and now you are trying to uh, sell more of the same product and produce more of the same product, but then people say, oh, it drop off. No. Yeah. How do you maintain that same quality? And the same thing goes for service industries. If you started out as a mom and pop environment, but now you are trying to replicate that experience at several large stores, how do you maintain the same quality? We have CEO of Fontana Pharmacy, Kevin O'Brien Chang, who's going to be telling us how they did it there at Fontana. So that's on Money Moves tomorrow. Uh, something to look out for. What else? Follow me, of course, all over social media, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Kalila Ray. Follow at Taking Stock JA on Instagram. And if you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. Of course, you also have everything on my website at your convenience, kalilareynolds.com. For financial information, you can use however you like it, watch, listen, or read. And of course, tell a friend about Taking Stock because what? Say it with me, everybody. Investing is the new Type it in. Investing is the new what? Is the new sexy. So let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Until next time.